infant man, ancient Medusa, all living things, plant and animal, are largely molecular arrangements of water. The pulsing life force of the exotically evolved Pelagia shares with the rhythmic contractions of the human heart a common ancestry, brewed in that unique cosmic plasma, the sea, mother of all life. Today marks the end of the third year of our expedition. Faithful Calypso has carried us nearly 140,000 nautical miles. And the divers have spent the one-man equivalent of 14 months in the depth. Yet we go on, farther and deeper in the sea. There is a fresh sense of urgency in our work, observing and reporting on the awesome alchemy of the sea. For we could well be the first witnesses to the death of life. It is tragic that among all the men scurrying about the tiny continental islands of our water planet, too few are able to sense the serum coursing in their veins. Too few who can feel, I am the sea, and the sea is me. Every living thing, eagles, roses, whales, butterflies, trees, fishes, corn, turtles, amoebas, and even man himself, all are mainly composed of organized water. No matter what the form of water, clouds, snow, dew, rivers, lakes, or glaciers, there is only one source of life-sustaining water, the sea. On no other planet of our entire solar system is there another great sea ripe with the vital elements of the universe. The Earth is the only water planet. Man, then, as a chance traveler on the water-gifted spaceship Earth, must never forget that all of the waters of the world today are the same waters which first materialized on the newly born Earth four and a half billion years ago. That's all the water there is. There won't be any more. If most inland bodies of water are not contaminated by men, they too are able to sustain specialized forms of life. But there are exceptions, such as the Great Salt Lake, or the aptly named Dead Sea. Another is here, Lake Assal in the Donakil Desert of West Africa's Somaliland. Without natural outlets, and located in once humid but now arid climates, the Dead Seas or salt lakes gradually evaporate. This causes the proportion of salts long ago derived from the surrounding rocks, to increase to a searing saturation, lethal to all life. 
Our diver, Serge Foulon, cannot resist proving out an old Archimedean principle. Sun shrunken to nearly 600 feet below sea level, the waters of Lake Assal are heavy with salt. The additional buoyancy turns Serge into a fishing bobber. The combined weight of Serge and his equipment is 200 pounds, normally balanced for diving in the sea. But only with the addition of 60 pounds of diving weight can Serge submerge below the surface of Lake Assal. In the hazy shallows, Serge quickly discovers sunken gardens of strange crystal flowers. Perhaps it is salt. So Serge obtains for us, not without difficulty, a lab specimen of this unusual mineral blossom. There are other rare bodies of water which can only support the most limited kind of life. Such are the much publicized crystal lakes of Florida and Australia, or the lesser known seven lakes of Madagascar. Beaded along the Tropic of Capricorn and terraced beneath the wind-scoured escarpments of the Lasallo Mountains, the seven lakes are fed by chilling streams of sun-distilled rain. Barely enriched by the erosion-resistant terrain, the water flows into the 25 feet deep basins, almost as pure as it was in its cumulus configuration. The incredible clarity of the water reveals its total barrenness. The only visible life are fragile algae clinging to the branches of decaying trees like saprophytic snow. Here, there are too few dissolved soils, too few suspended mineral nutrients to cloud the water with fecundity. There is a lack of photosynthetic plants here, and without plants, underwater creatures cannot survive. It is only in the sea that the chemistry for life remains relatively stable. Here, phosphates, nitrates, iron compounds, all the salts of the earth and the gases of the atmosphere are energized by the sun. And they have long been stirred by the winds and tides into 330 million cubic miles of a life-producing protoplasm. It is estimated that 200 billion tons of drifting aquatic dust, microscopic specks of plant life, bloom in the sea each year. These enormous pastures of phytoplankton are the first link in a long, complex food chain interconnecting several hundred thousand species of marine life and ultimately man. During the first 100,000 years of his existence, most men dwelled along coastal areas. Hence, man's integration with the life cycles of the sea was more direct, more apparent. For example, 
he might use the remains of a fish he had eaten to trap a crab. He would then use the crab to catch small bait fish. The bait fish would then be used to catch a larger fish for him and his family to eat. Once more, with the remains of the large fish, he would catch another crab, and so on, repeating the process over and over again throughout his short lifespan. Then, upon his death, all that he was was returned to the deep. The essences of his body slowly seep back to the waters of their origin. The Maldive islanders of the Indian Ocean conduct their ancient rites of the sea in a quaint but nevertheless efficient manner. In their Viking-like fishing craft, built hull first, with the ribs added afterwards, they construct a live bait compartment drilled with holes below the water line. This method of keeping the bait lively works, but it also means the Maldivers are sailing perpetually sinking ships. So to remain afloat, crewmen must perpetually bail. So there is more method to this Maldivian madness than meets the eye. Charming of a few Judas bait fish combined with the agitation of the water's surface deceives hungry bonito into a frenzy of feeding. Savagely, they attack the flashing splashes, which no doubt appear to be a school of escaping fry. Among some of the Maldives fishermen, there is an ancient law. Take no more from the sea in one day than there are people in your village. If observed, it is said, the bonito will run well again another day. Beyond the shallow water horizons of the Maldive Islands, other men fish for the people of their villages. They catch 200,000 tons of fish daily, 100 million tons a year. The villages have grown. As the world population soars and its land resources shrink, man has accelerated his exploitation of the sea. His technology is imaginative and efficient, but potentially disastrous. For the sea, mother of all life on the water planet, is not, after all, invulnerable. The future of the sea is now dependent upon man's understanding of her strength and precarities and man's profound respect for her life-producing nature. The alternative is clear. We have not sighted another ship in weeks. Often I am vaguely haunted by a fantasy that we are alone, that beyond the horizon there is no longer a landfall. But the sun draws reason to the surface and my thoughts return to our primary mission, to observe and record on film the life song of the sea. In 1893, Frenchman Louis Boutin was the first to succeed in taking underwater pictures. It was said that he achieved his remarkable results 
in the face of obstacles that would give pause to ordinary men. Today, filming in the depths of the water planet still remains a formidable task. Frequently, we must improvise our filming techniques because of our diving time or the wariness of wildlife. For example, the shy garden eels withdraw tail first into their sand burrows. To film this exceptional method of defense, two remotely operated cameras are required. One wide angle, the other for close-ups. Another diver then approaches the meadow of eels, causing them to take protective cover in their own unique way. Calypso cameramen must constantly struggle with poor visibility, turbulent currents, and pressure problems but their greatest concern is keeping the interior of their cameras dry. The results of their unimaginable patience and stamina can be annihilated even by the slightest leak. Hence, detail stripping, desalting, and reassembly of the 326 pieces of a flooded precision instrument takes priority over all other ships' work. But not for long. For the team of 29 who man Calypso, life aboard is an incessant labor. Repair and re-repair, improvise and re-improvise, and when it's all fixed, all fashioned, refix it and refashion it all over again. The work requires pros, men who've got guts and brains, and few romantic illusions. There are no Conrads here, no Melvilles, no Lowrys, only realists with two or more trades, only men who can endure ignore or shrug off long confinement, the perpetual rack and pitch of Calypso, the endless cacophony of wind, sea, machinery, and other men's work. And when it isn't fix it, it's scrub it or paint it. An endless fight against corrosion, peeling, blistering. Whatever the job, complex or mundane, the men of Calypso do it, and they do it well. They all know that they are vital parts of a collective endeavor, that our discoveries will be seen by millions of television viewers, and that our awe will echo in the hearts of young people worldwide. Work about Calypso is also no nine to five proposition. For while there are intermittent meals and sleep bikes, the work is continuous. But then, of course, there is always the unexpected. In the darkness of an early morning, a runaway engine. Intuitively, the pajama clad Falco goes over the side. 1,800 miles from the nearest dry dock facility, Calypso's starboard propeller shaft is snapped off clean at its bearing case. Water drag has carried it back against the rudder, jamming it. Calypso is helpless. At first light, the emergency work party moves into action. A filmed record of the operation will be made, while at the same time, underwater television cameras will enable Cousteau to direct the work from topside. With extreme caution, the divers move to secure the precariously balanced 400-pound bronze propeller. Below them lies 13,000 feet of water. The loss of the prop would mean serious delays in Cousteau's schedule. Next, the divers remove the propeller cap nut. In the choppy sea, there's no certainty that the winch cables will hold. All 
all's well for the moment, but a lengthy dry docking lies ahead. Later that night, Captain Cousteau makes an entry in his personal logbook. At times, I find myself flirting with the morbid seduction of lassitude. The constant breakdowns, repairs, delays empty me of resolve. And in the bilges of my mind, I deeply resent anything and anybody which interrupts our dreams of action. Even the necessity of dry docking or taking on fuel and provisions becomes adversity. And in the blackest of my black moments, when my imagination has worn thin, I feel I can no longer tolerate this constantly rocking and dripping ship. Its bugs, chlorinated water, its deafening noises, even the bell calling us to meals. Our poor cook, I hate him too for competing to make our stomachs the focus of our expeditions. Even the joyous interruptions of our infrequent mail calls demoralizes me. And then, those agonizing questions. Am I sincere? Why am I doing all this? And who, after all, cares? Only the tiny seas of my cells reply, reminding me too that I am the sea, and the sea is me. In the morning sun, Cousteau directs his divers to investigate a disturbance in the sea. Cousteau knows that often when the birds of the sea gather in shrieking assembly and dive frantically beneath the surface, it signals the presence of death. A ravaged mola mola, an oceanic sunfish, has attracted the scavenging gray gulls. Like winged piranhas, they strip the flesh from the still living mola mola. This day, death is a sea lion, several of them. Momentarily distracted by Calypso's divers and cameramen, they now return to claim what is theirs. Below, the divers discover that the sea lions have torn off the tall dorsal and ventral swimming fins of several mola mola fish. Even their stabilizing pectoral fins have been chewed away from their bodies. Stripped of their ability to swim and maneuver, the mola molas will now become a live food reserve for the cunning and resourceful sea lions. Once convinced that the captive Mola Mola is exhausted and helpless, the sea lions scatter in search of other prey. In the natural world, there is no cruelty, no charity, and no hypocrisy. Things are simply what they are. Since the beginning, there has been no good, no evil in the wild. Only a day-to-day -day existence fraught with perpetual fights and struggles against environment, parasites, enemies. One cannot moralize about the purity of nature. 
Indeed, long before man and his ideas, nature endured. And who knows, in the end, it may be nature which prevails. Exploring in the depths of the sea is grinding work. Yet as Calypso crisscrosses the wide oceans of the world, following the migrations of life and the seasons of the sea, there is time to rest, time to feed the body and spirit. Each man must decide for himself what's most restorative. Topside bosun's mate, it's making friends with the easily tameable triggerfish. For Andre Le Bon, it's a quiet afternoon with his paints and easel. Alone at last, away from it all. Alone, that is, except for the always ubiquitous kibitzer. But 100 feet down, there's a grace note. Le Bon will be spared that eternal question, what is it? And the kibitzer will be spared a reply of equal acuity. Appraising his work, Laban moodily reflects back to the occasion of his first important showing. Celebrities, critics, champagne, music. Gallery Row in Los Angeles. It was loud, gay, friendly, and everybody was there. Fantastic, they said. Bold and vivid, excitingly fresh. The phrases warmed the air, and Le Bon's innocent ego. So why, broods Le Bon? Why didn't anyone say, how much? Next to diving, the closest thing to a diver's heart is gastronomic. With luck and a little free time, the two interests sometimes coincide brilliantly. Forty pounds of fresh lobsters, and then an extraordinary find sea-chilled bottles with a tantalizingly familiar color and shape. Cousteau is astonished, and the divers expectant. They explain, 
they discovered the remains of a wrecked ship, a cargo vessel. Gauged by its deterioration, they estimated its age to be about 50 years. Deep within the crumpled vessel, probably the galley, they found stacks of chinaware and a mother load of the carefully packed bottles. To the divers, it was simply a matter of fate. Quite obviously, royal lobster tails deserve to be accompanied by a beverage of exotic interest. No time was wasted in returning to Calypso. Cool, tangy English brew. Good reason for a good time. The men of Calypso, all men of the sea, know well that life can be short and that the good life is best whenever and wherever you find it. Demoiselle du Cap, grillé, flammé au whisky. I know, too, that sometimes the men of Calypso hide moments of loneliness and desperation. But somehow, this breed of man can always find a way out of darkness. <laughs>
Few ports of call for the sea roaming Calypso are 20th century. But when they are, it's an occasion. Cousteau is adventure, courage, news. The curious, the concerned, the well-wishers welcome him. Their most common question, how can I help? Cousteau's most frequent reply, love life. Perhaps above all, it is this capacity of Cousteau to love all life, which prompts to memory vivid images of his total commitment to the sea. For Cousteau, what's past is indeed prologue. Many tasks lie ahead, some to begin, some to complete, and time has a way of running out. Not long ago, the Pacific walrus, monarchs of the Arctic, flourished a quarter of a million strong. But today the herds have been reduced greatly by bullet and lance. They are not very elegant, the great ones who walk with their teeth. But they deserve compassion and protection. I believe there are more important things in life than hides, oil, meat, or ivory. I am also anxious to complete our film on the red salmon, the anadromous strain. As adults, salmon cruise the depth of the sea. But to spawn a new generation, they are compelled to return thousands of miles to the same freshwater streams of their birth. Many never make it. Commercial fishermen net them by the ton, and thousands are defeated by the insurmountable waterfalls blocking their way upstream. The salmon who do clear the water obstacles must face other adversaries, predator or climate, for a single season of low rainfall can often make the final leg of the salmon's journey home the most hazardous. The unfinished project which presents us with the most problems also gives us the most pleasure, the sea otter. Extraordinarily intelligent and crafty, we have found sea otters the most difficult of all sea creatures to observe, to study, to film in the wild. But slowly, we are making friends with these gourmets of the sea.
once technically extinct but now completely protected, the sea otter thrives. His fastidiousness is remarkable. If the sea otter's fur is soiled by food or mud, it means loss of insulation and exposure to lethally low temperatures. Grooming, therefore, is constant and comical. In 1944, Operation Hailstone was acclaimed a great American victory against Japan. The Battle of Truk Island was sweet revenge, they said, for the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. Today, the largest concentration of sunken planes and ships in the world lies in one of the most lovely underwater paradise in the South Seas. Still entombed within this decomposing residue of violence are the countless artifacts and drifting bones of those who once dared dream the dream of war. We are anxious to complete our documentation of this tragic encounter between man and nature. Devilfish, most common misnomer for the shy and intelligent octopus. Even our divers admitted at first slight revulsion at the thought of handling the tentacled creatures. But in the end, divers and octopus became, they said, quite attached to each other. Our study of the behavior of the octopus will take many months. Observing them under controlled conditions is an exercise in patience. Houdini of the deep, the captive octopus is a notorious escape artist. As hunters of crustaceans in underwater holes and caves, the octopus has developed the ability of passing his entire body through an opening no larger than the diameter of one of his tentacles. So our specimen octopus has little difficulty in slipping through a sheave hole on his quiet and deliberate journey back to the sea. We are always hurrying to observe the oldest behavior of the ocean's denizens. Today, our curiosity is aroused by a pack of thousands of barracuda. En masse, they surround their quarry and devour a few whenever they feel the urge. Small and large barracuda, the octopus who vanishes in the night, wrecks consigned to the ocean floor, salmon, walrus, sea otters. An old song of the sea returns to mind. 
I will go back to the great sweet mother, mother and lover of man, the sea. I will go down to her, I and none other, close with her, kiss her, and mix her with me.